Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Really Dicey. On today's episode, we're going to discuss magic items and how to make them more magical. With me, as always, is Manny. We also have Scott Harris King, DM extraordinaire, and Seth Timmons, expert player, to give us a, his perspective from the other side of the screen. So let's just uh, get started right away. Dungeons and Dragons, and to a lot other extent, you know, all fantasy games and almost all role-playing games have magical items or their equivalent. But sometimes uh, these can seem not quite as magical as they should be. And so today we're going to talk about things you can do to help. So uh, let's start right off. Manny, what do you do to make magical items seem magical? Usually when I come across a situation like that, it's because it's usually items that are very commonplace in most modules. A uh, plus one uh, uh, arm to armor class, uh, potions of healing, um, uh, things of that variety. Um, usually what I try to do is, so I, I make my magic items rare, you mm -hmm. know? So if you find one's a really big deal, I, I don't do magic shops. Uh, mm -hmm. We could we could talk about that later if you want. Sure, sure. Um, uh, but yeah, they should be rare. And each each magic item, uh, even if they have the same type of properties, should be different. Have some sort of side effect in some way. So a potion of heat, like so, does it does it make sense if all of us cooked? No, if all of us made a sandwich, you know, a peanut butter jelly sandwich, perhaps our sandwiches would not be the same. So why would potions of healing make the wizards be the same? The others. I don't, never made sense to me i would some of them might have maybe uh uh especially if they're they're sloppy they have some adverse effects uh or if they had um certain um, uh, philosophies their potions may reflect that as well you know um uh I, to give a probably the best example i've ever i've seen is matt actually if i if i don't mind if you don't mind me putting in the spotlight you did this thing years ago where you had a cleric who was, I think, worshiping spiders, but I don't think that clerk was evil. I can't remember. But when they, when that that clerk was healing someone with a, a generic healing spell, uh, they used spiders to heal up the wounds of it. Like spiders came out of nowhere and started healing everything up. And I thought, I thought, wow, that's 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 great. That because because that it, it, it makes something that most games that I've seen just kind of like save real fast and just go on to the next thing you actually made emphasis on that special that's special why i remember so much because it just really stood out um so like i so like i would i would just do little things like maybe if uh uh you have a, a belt of, of of maybe you turn green maybe you'll have like big arms like popeye you know some sort of weird side effect something that that players will remember mm -hmm. um if you have a, a plus one to defense in some way maybe your your skin turns a little more gray and stony uh or maybe a little more metallic or maybe some other weird special effect um just so just so that each so that just to make the game feel a little special most when you get higher up then weapons become much more specialized so that i'm not too worried about you know um when they find their excaliburs and and mm -hmm. drag lances but uh but uh but yeah that that's what i that's what I've been doing. Yeah, no, that that sounds great. That that's good advice. Giving us giving things special effects, really. And uh, I love the the idea of uh, side effects. <laughs> so uh, Scott, what do you do to spice up your magical items? Well, I'm I'm kind of on the same page as as Emmanuel here. I um, it depends a little bit on whether you're playing like in a, a high magic world or a low magic world. Um, you know, I remember when we were playing back in college it was usually a high magic world so it'd be like everything you're wearing is plus three this and plus two that and there's just yeah. like everything's magical and you go to magic shops and you buy magic items i prefer to play in a, in a low magic world the big thing for me i think is to think about um the magic items in storytelling terms similar to what emmanuel was just saying um but specifically tailored i guess a little bit to the the player that's going to be using the item because one thing that happens particularly in a low magic world where you do have fewer items is that the items become um a, a, have a bigger role in the gameplay so when a, when a player is going to be using this item a lot as part of how they play the character it really helps it will shape uh how their character 
plays. And so it, it helps to have a storytelling reasons or at least take that into account. For instance, it's not a, uh, we played a game recently where Seth's character, we were playing um, in Hex, we were playing the uh, Journey of the Center of the Earth in, in the 1930s. Right. And he had this device that could sense the Atlantean artifacts. Using that device was a central part of his character's gameplay. So it's important to have that be a device that that fit in with how he was going to be playing the character because it shaped the whole experience, not just for him, but for the whole party. Uh, so just does, when you're designing the magic items, take into account the character that's going to be having the item and how it's going to affect the way their character plays. Um, so I try to emphasize like the storytelling behind the items because it changes your storytelling going forward when you introduce these items to the game. Yeah, no, that's fantastic advice. That's that's really good. Um, <clears throat> I like the idea of the magical item becoming almost part of the character and a signature of the character because you do see that a lot um, in books and in movies and in myths and things. Characters are defined by this. I mean, yeah. Arthur is defined by Excalibur. It's not just something he has it's it's a big part of his character that's good advice so seth from your side of the screen what do you like to see in magical items well one of the things i love especially about reading about magical items of course this is more for the sort of game masters and dms rather than the player characters is i love magic items with backstories unfortunately the player character were hardly ever know the backstory of a magic item unless uh, it's some sort of mental telepathy or he finds a book or Bard, he happen happens to know about it. Um, I like I like magic items that are a bit more interesting rather than just a plus two longsword or something that I tend to like the more utility magic items. Uh, like, um, oh, there was, what, there was one cape that allowed you to I think it was called Cape of the Manta Ray or something. It allowed you to look yep. like a manta ray and swim really fast underwater or like a ring of feather falling. Uh, instead of it look like a normal ring, it would look like, you know, interlocked feathers around your finger. Um, magic items that more utility, more or more connection with the type of magic that's in it, like uh, maybe a ring of feather falling, as Emmanuel was saying, a side effect. Maybe a side effect is you start to grow feathers or sure, or, sure. or a ring of spider climb. Um, well, those side effects would probably be more on the horror side, but, <laughs> sure, um, sure. but yeah, I definitely like magic items that are a bit more than just a plus one ring or plus one this or something yeah. like that. And I also, like Scott was saying, I tend to like, um, I love finding magic items, but I can understand in a, if you're doing a high magic setting, then they're just commonplace. That, you know, if, if they're all, if they're, if all magic items, anybody can just walk up and buy one, then they just kind of, I don't know, lose their, lose their allure. Yes. Yeah. No, I think you're right. You, you don't want them to become, technology um you know, yes uh, readily available and easily used and um but i like what you were saying about um utility magical items i, I like magical items that uh have several different uses and you kind of have to think to use them right you know if you've got a, a flaming sword you can see people with it in late fires but um one of the, my favorite items, I think I just gave it to you guys in a game, were uh, immovable rods. I, I love immovable rods. These, for those of you who don't know, these are about a foot long magic, uh, you know, metal rods, just straight metal rods, and they've got a little button at one end. And when you depress the button, they become locked in space, wherever they are. Like if you put it three feet above the ground, you hit the button and then you let it go, it just hangs there, nothing can move it. And that's really fascinating because you can use it to, if you have two of them, you can use them for, a, you can make a ladder out of them. You can use them to hold the door shut. 
um, or open. Um, you know, if if you squeezed through someplace, you could you could abandon it behind you to stop somebody else from coming through. It's just got a million uses. Um, along the same lines, I love the portable hole. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, um, uh, the, the piece of fabric like a uh, black hole that you can just put on places like like an Acme character and you've got a hole. <laughs> there are so many different ways you can use that. You know, a shield, you can you can uh, drain a pond with it, you can you can hide in it, you can do all sorts of crazy stuff. But um, yeah, no, I, I agree there. Um, I think that um, when you're designing and placing magic items, one thing you do have to work out for is you, um, you don't want them to become too common as you were saying. This again depends a lot on um, your world, whether it's high magic or low magic, but I, I prefer the, the low magic. Um, I think it's important to remember that uh, magical items are difficult to make. So everyone's gonna have, uh, you know, it, it's gonna be storied. It's gonna be have an interesting history. Um, you know, I remember when, when, when I was playing D&D and someone pointed this out about magic swords, they said, who's making these magic swords? And I thought, well, wizards are. And someone said, well, wizards can't use swords. And I thought, oh, well, then each one has a really good reason to, to be spending all that time and energy and resources to be making something for somebody else. What's going on there? So, um, so I think, uh, you know, I also think that uh, magical items should be or could be famous could have names like you know like Excalibur um, and they could be famous in your world and they could have beyond their magical powers or, or, or maybe even in place of their magical powers they could have cultural importance they could be famous there could be there could be organizations grown up around them people can take oaths to protect them like like the uh, dragon lances and, and dragon lance I was just been rereading some of those comics and uh, it was it was interesting to be reminded how important and famous those uh, those things were. Um, the, the old uh, sorry to jump in the yeah. old um, Middle Earth I, ice role playing game. They had a separate book, their treasures of Middle Earth, and they had of course some more famous ones like Glamdring, and um, I can't remember the other ones Sting. And but they had a lot of other ones taken from the Cimmerillions and some they just made up. But they all, like you're saying, they all were named. They yeah. all named, gave a backstory about. So they were all famous in one degree or another. Yeah. Yeah, the Book of Treasures, right? I believe yes. It's called? Yes. Yeah, that's that's yeah. one of my favorite uh, like magic item books. No, yeah, that was really cool. That was really awesome. Um, and you know, I think it's important to remember that magical items can be important beyond their magical abilities. Um, look at the look at the importance uh, placed on the Arkin Stone. What does the Arkin Stone do? I, it never came up, but it was so <laughs> important that <laughs> nations were willing to go to war for it. Um, and maybe it's maybe it's magical powers were just that it was really, really beautiful. Um, and you know it's it's easy to overlook that sort of thing when you're when you're playing a game because you you're looking for something that'll make your character better in a fight or help you adventuring, but um, you know this, this the Arkenstone could help you lead an army, or 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 stop a war. <laughs> uh, so, you know I think there's a lot more to be got out of magical items than just the bonus here and there. Yeah, um, I would just uh, if I could just jump in. Like, what's interesting about that is. Uh, well, I see a, a common thread between the sort of utility magic items that Seth was talking about and the items you're talking about where the magic is in the storytelling and not not like a literal necessarily magical power because both of those can affect gameplay in a way that common magic items don't. If I've got a sword plus two or a ring of defense plus two or a saving throw ring plus three or something, it doesn't actually affect the gameplay. It only affects the number on the die that I rolled. But if I have a utility item where I've got to figure out how to do it, or if I've got an item that's got a story that's going to change how people react to me in the game, those actually affect the storytelling in a way that just having a plus number just doesn't do. 
Uh, and I, I, for me, it's all really all about the story. So um, that's where that's where I lean towards. It's it's also another way to make the character or the player feel more special. I mean, it, especially what uh, Manuel was saying earlier, um, if you have a long quest to get something uh, or it's this, this character and like there's only one or two of these specific magic items and this player character has it, it really, I would think, draws the player in more, gets them more invested because they have this special thing that nobody else does. It's something that makes them unique. And if and if it is after a huge like arc or whatever, they've just invested all this time and made sacrifices in order to get it. Yeah, no, de definitely. Anything you've got to work for feels uh, feels more valuable. Yeah. The so, other thing, just to piggyback off that real quick, yeah. is that. Um, when the magic items are more common and less specific it almost turns the game into more of like a a video game like a video role playing game like a like a loot finder you know it's like if you play world of warcraft every all, every item you get is magical and they all you know it's all like plus three to this plus ten to that and there's so everything's got like different levels of how magic -y it is but the other thing is, because of the way those games work, none of them are individual. No matter how rare or special the thing is, there's 15 other people standing in town using the exact same item. <laughs> and when you're playing in high magic worlds where you sort of everything, there's magic items everywhere and they don't really affect your character, you basically run the risk of, of it just being sort of like a, you know, a loot finally like you're playing zork or something right yeah yeah definitely um one other thing i, w I wanted to mention is that uh, when you're crafting uh, magical items and you're placing magical items you really want to um take your setting into account not just high magical high magic versus low magic but uh your your whole um game play the, the style of game you have. So um, you want your, your magical items to increase the drama of the games and make things more exciting. So I, what I'm getting at is if you have a game that heavily tracks resources, like it pays attention to light sources and you track your rations and you keep track of encumbrance, uh, then you wanna, you wanna uh, think carefully before giving them something as simple as a staff of light. Um, whereas in, in a game that really, in a, in, in a really loose, vague sort of game, or a game that doesn't pay too much attention to who's got the torch and who's got the light, uh, a, the fact that your sword gives out some light, no one's gonna pay any attention to. But if you're playing in a game where you're really tracking that really hard and you're keeping track of how many torches you have left and, and whether there's a breeze that blows out your torch and you could be, all be thrown into darkness and none of you have infravision, then then a magical item that casts light is incredible. It, it, I mean, it is, it is so much more useful than a sword plus three because now we can see in the dark and we're not going to be eaten by a Gru. <laughs> um, so, um, so just think about that more carefully. You know, just just pay pay attention to that. I mean, a bag of holding, bag of holdings. When I played D and D, were were not exactly a dime a dozen, but they're one of the more common magical items. I think because a lot of DMs didn't want to bother with encumbrance and that sort of thing, and mm -hmm. players just wanted to carry around a ridiculous amount of loot. That's fine, but you know, in a different style of play, where you have to make hard decisions about what you carry and what you can't, and when you're encumbered. Um, then introducing a bag of holding takes that all away. It just all suddenly goes away and no one has to carry, care about how much loot they can pick up. And maybe you want that and maybe you don't. I think it's just something you need to, you need to think about and be aware of. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, so you want your items to be interesting, useful, but maybe not too useful. Yeah, balance is a, is a big deal. For, for me and my games. That's why going back to magic shops, I, I tend to dislike magic shops because 
to me, it doesn't make any sense story structure wise why a kingdom will have a magic shop in their town, a place. It would be like, like, a, hey, let's have a nuclear a store for nuclear weapons down the block. I'm sure nothing bad's gonna happen. Yeah, make it two dollars exactly. each. You know, like, why would such powerful items uh, shop available to to anyone that could come in and get it? To me, that that would make no sense. I would, as a as someone that ruled that nation, will take that magic shop, buy everything, or take everything, and use it for my soldiers or myself. Sure. Why? Why share? Um, so for yes. me, if, if if you're gonna have a oh, uh, if if well, I'll say it real fast. If if you're gonna have a match up, it, the world has to make sense of why. It, like magic has to be really commonplace yeah. for me for me to feel like invested or feel that the world is realistic to me. If that makes sense, even though it's fantasy. Sure, sure. Or how about this? You can still have a magic shop in a low in a low magic world, but it's hard to find. It's on the corner, and and the mm. old mysterious guy behind the counter doesn't bring out the magic for everybody. Just every he sees something about you, and he reaches down and he pulls out a little cage, and it's got a magwai in it. And here you go. <laughs> you know. I was about to <laughs> say gremlins. I, you beat me to it. Wow. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly that sort of thing. So uh, yeah. Yeah. Who did uh, I did I cut off someone? No, uh, I think Seth had something to say. Oh, that magic item is too expensive. Okay, I'll just buy these thieves' tools. And what time do you close? <laughs> oh, okay. <Yeah>, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, where do you guys go uh, for inspiration when you're designing magical items? Where do you go? Um, well, again, for me, a, a lot of it is, is story driven and character driven. So, the first inspiration that I go to is actually the character. You know, I like systems like we we're talking again to go back to that example that I used with Seth's character when we were playing Hex. That is a system where you can, when you're creating the character, you can allocate a certain amount of your character creation points to get an item, which is where Seth got his originally. And so, if I'm creating an item for that sort of situation, I can take into account what the player is wants to do with the character how they want to play what what that character is going to be like and design an item based around the story we're going through but also specifically the character uh so it's less of a i tend to look less for outside inspiration and more inside the game itself for the inspiration um of course i read a lot of comic books so uh there's a lot of superheroes and super villains that have strange powers and weird backstories and you know whatever um, so I would probably tend to think in those terms, um, depending on what the story called for. Um, but really I look, I look at the character to see what the character is trying, uh, how the player wants to play the character. And also I look at the story setting that we're in and the plot, like the, the campaign we're doing to figure out how the item might affect the the campaign and design around the effect that I want it to have. So if, like, if we're doing, if we're going to like this dungeon or this castle and I know there's gonna be something like in there, I might design an item that might be useful in certain situations or might affect, you know, the geopolitical whatever situation when they meet this person. Um, and so design it less around, um, what the item does uh, in terms of, you know, shooting a beam of light or whatever, and more in terms of how what it does affects the gameplay. Sure. Okay. No, that, that's cool. I, I like that. So you go to the game itself for inspiration. That's good. That's good. Um, one thing I wanted to mention uh, that I use is uh, Wikipedia's list of mythological objects. Uh, which is great. We'll put the link in the description. It's this giant link of, uh, you know, everything. Um, all the famous items from, uh, you know, the Golden Fleece to the Holy Grail to uh, the, the Cap of Invisibility um, and all sorts of things. And uh, I like to take inspiration from those. And that's just a great list to lead, read through. Uh, one uh, very interesting uh, place I go to is uh, actually religious relics. 
because they are, by their very nature, they have absolutely fantastic stories. Now, I'd be very careful about like dropping in an actual religious relic. <laughs> um, uh, but you can take inspiration. You can kind of change them around. You can mix them up. And depending on your game, you can you can move in. You can get you know you can put in a lot of things. The, the hex game that uh, Scott mentioned that was taking place in 1930s Earth. So a lot of those things you could drop straight in. Uh, maybe not a maybe not a religious object, but you can take inspiration on uh, for all sorts of things. Oh, just just really quickly go on at Manny because he mentioned um, potions. One of the things, uh, whenever I've been in groups, whenever we find a potion that we don't know what it is, we just set it aside until we're all about to die. And it, then it doesn't really matter if it's poison or not because we're going to die anyway and we figure what the hell. So. Oh, yes, yeah. I remember that. I remember those days, yes. No, yeah. I, I recently... Um, you know, I, I, I was reading uh, an issue of uh, Knights at the Dinner Table, and they found the potion in a bottle that had a little poem on it. And I repurposed that into a game I was running. And I like that idea. I, I like the idea of giving the players clues, you know, some way to figure out what this potion does besides just drinking it. <laughs> uh, because... I don't know. Uh, like like Scott says, that that can be really random. It's rarely helpful. Um, even if it's a helpful potion, it might not be the help you want. <laughs> you know, great. Now I can levitate. That wasn't our problem. <laughs> uh, I can remember many games where we have like found like four or five potions, and we're we're all like about to die, and it's like, chug this potion. And it's like, oh, okay, I just healed a cut on my arm. Well, that didn't help. Let me chug this potion. And it's like, you know, I can breathe underwater, but we're not underwater. And you just keep <laughs> drinking them until you're like, you know, you're just a, like a green blob floating on the ceiling with like six arms and like the strength of a thousand men. But like, <laughs> or you, know. you can mix them together and whip out your old books and look at the miscability tables. Yep. <laughs> Mis miscability tables. God, those were so lethal. Anyway, uh, this has been fantastic. This has been a, a, a great conversation. Uh, I'd like to revisit it again sometime. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining me, and I want to thank you for watching. So uh, if you want to see more of this, like and subscribe. And until next time, take care.